I think this election is going to be mainly about the jobs. There are people who their wages have been stagnant, the prices keep on going up. What can government do or not do to help wages, help jobs, and that kind of I think government can get out of the way. I think that uh, government can let the American people do what they do best. There's so much uncertainty out there. You know, businesses have a lot of, especially large businesses, they've got a lot of cash on their balance sheets right now. But they don't know how to deploy that money into the economy because they don't know what's going to be going on at a regulatory standpoint. They don't know what's going to be going on at a tax standpoint. So we have to provide uh, a long-term vision. I, I guarantee you guys, when you guys sit down um, with your family at your kitchen table and you start budgeting you know, your, your mortgage, your car payment, your insurance payments, when you start mortgaging your grocery bills, your, your power bills, and everything else, you know, maybe, maybe tuition, who knows what. But when you balance, when you budget, you don't look six months into the future. You don't look a year into the future. You look five years into the future. You look ten years into the future. And the small businesses make plans where they're going to go buy a big truck, which creates jobs. Or if they're going to go out there and they're going to buy, you know, the farmers are going to buy a combine, which creates jobs. Or if a small business is going to buy, uh, you know, build a, build a building to house their office or sign a lease, a long-term lease, they plan. Where, where am I going to be a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now? We don't do that in Washington. Everything is, you know, we're so short-sighted in Washington right now. So I think what government needs to do is it needs to get out of the way, and it needs to provide a vision or a sense of confidence to the American people and to businesses where the economy is going, where the tax code is going to be, where the regulatory code is going to be, so that they can say, okay, I feel comfortable about the direction of the economy, the direction of taxes, the direction of regulations in the next five years. I'm going to build that building. I'm going to buy that truck. I'm going to invest in, in, uh, in, in, in a new company. I'm going to take that job. Right now, there's no confidence. So we need to govern out of the way. And like I said before, instead of the EPA uh, running around the 12th Congressional District, we need coal miners running around the 12th Congressional District. We need, uh, we, need, we need farmers farming with confidence. We need coal miners mining with confidence. We need small businessmen creating jobs with confidence. We need a private citizens investing in their pension or their 401k with confidence. And when that stuff happens, it, there is no more hardworking, optimistic, uh, or um, creative people in the world than the American people. We've shown that time and time again. It's like Ronald Reagan said, you know, back in 1980. It's like JFK did. When JFK cut taxes, you cut taxes government out of the way, the American people will do just fine. This administration continues to throw red tape, they throw up hurdles, and they just get in the way of the American people. And that's what frustrates me. There's so much opportunity. You know, the 12th Congressional District, could you be more, could you be better situated geographically in the United States? Look at the, the interstate networks that go through here. Look at, look at the rivers that go through here. Look at the access we have to, to air terminals. We're in a wonderful geographic location. We've got unbelievable amounts of coal and oil and gas. We've got a great transportation industry. We've got a potential for a great manufacturing industry. We've got great people. And we're struggling. Well, it's public policy. So, <clears throat> question way over there. In uh, 2006, the Internal Revenue Service did not collect $385 billion. What would you do to take care of that? Make sure they collect the amount due. When, when, sir, uh, if you hold on to that for a second, when you said they did not collect $385 billion? That's true. Uh, well, I assume, is that people, are you referring to people that just didn't pay what they owed or money that was left on the table? or? I'm just referring to uh, they didn't collect it. They said, Sure. Well, I think the best way to collect the most amount of revenue for, for government is um, is to make the tax code more simple. Um, you know, I, I, I'll never forget the study, and I don't remember the exact number, but it was twenty or thirty different of the top uh, tax attorneys in, in the country, and. Uh, I think it was the Heritage Foundation maybe that did it, but they gave them, not, not a super complex, but a, a decent um, um, tax return. And they gave it to it was either the top 20 or 30 uh, tax attorneys in the country, and they said, tell us how much this fake person, 
we filled out this, tell us how much this person owes. And they did not get two answers that were the same. And if you take the 20 or 30 most brilliant tax attorneys in the country, and you give them a not too complex tax, uh, tax return, and they can't figure out how much the person owes. I think it shows our tax system's messed up. We're leaving money. I guarantee you, we're leaving money on the table because you've got these companies and these people who are taking advantage of these loopholes that need to be closed, and because you've got a lot of people that are doing things. Um, at, people are doing. They feel that the tax code's rigged against them, and so they're not doing things that would create tax revenue. They're not making those investments. You know, right now someone might be investing with, you know, if there's capital gains tax at 15%, maybe they'll go ahead and invest in that stock and, and help spur the economy. But if capital gains goes to 30% or 40%, the risk, it doesn't make sense. The risk and reward isn't there. You know, if, uh, if, you know, if you look at what's going on here in the state of Illinois, you know, the, the citizens of the state of Illinois, that, that tax code, that tax increase, it added um, the 67% tax increase, basically for the average family, that was one more week of work that just went to pay for the tax increase. And so you got a lot of people going, well, you know, if I spend four and a half or five months of my year just working to pay my tax bill, maybe I'll just go ahead and retire. And so you've got these people that are 55 or 60 or 65 that could work for five or 10 more years and want to work for five or 10 more years, but instead they just say, you know what, forget about it. It's just, it's not worth it. And so um, there's a lot of money left on the table. But the way we're going to drive more revenue, the way we're going to make sure we don't leave money on the table, is we have a simple tax code that people understand and that that incentivizes work, investment, and savings. And that, that's how we do it. I've got uh, time for one last question. I see it there in the back, so we'll, we'll get that question, and then we'll close here. Hello. Yes, ma'am. You touched a little bit on the war on women. Um, I'm a conservative woman. I'm a mother. I work outside the home. Um, I don't feel that any of the Democrats are representing me in any way. Um, how would you represent working women in their rights? Well, I, I think, uh, to be blunt, we shouldn't be talking about working men and working women. We should be talking about working people. You know, um, I, I, think, I think that, like I said, this administration, there's going to be a lot of bright and shiny objects. It's going to be a war on women, it's going to be a war on senior citizens, it's going to be a war on the kids, the youth, you know, all these different things. Pretty soon, you know, there's we're going to be fighting a war on ourselves because there's going to be nobody left. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, they create these divides. That's what frustrates me. You know, I think one reason why Ronald Reagan was so popular with Republicans and Democrats is the guy was so optimistic. And he was so nice. And he, he wanted, you know, the, the bright, shiny, you know, uh, city on the hill. He wanted all American people to do well. And all I see from this administration and their Democrat allies is how can we divide up the American population? How can we pit these people against these people? How can we pit these people against these people? And how can we make the young and the old mad at each other? How can we make the men and the women mad at each other? How can we make the, you know, the, the Hispanic folks or the white folks or the black folks or you know, all these different groups, how can we make them mad at each other? And that's not what it's about. What it's about is if you're a female and you want to work, or you're a male and you want to work, there's a job there for you. And it's not a government job. It's a job that provides you opportunity to go to work, to show up on time, to get a paycheck, to be proud of the paycheck, to go home, to put food on the table, and to have an opportunity to, to, to build your life, to work your way up the food chain, to be proud of what you do, to have a, a, a stable job, a quality job that you can be proud of. And, and I'm sick and tired of these people that, that don't like that. They want to divide and conquer the population. As your congressman, you know, I don't care if you're a union or non-union, female or male or young or old, black or white. I want you to be able to find a job. And all of those things. Are the, the only thing that I see right now amongst all those demographics is the fact that each one of them is hurting to find a job right now. And that's what I'm going to fight to change as your congressman. I'm not going to get distracted by the divisions. I'm not going to get distracted by the bright, shiny objects. I'm going to talk about the issues that you all care about, and I know what those issues are. So um, as I said at the beginning, this is, I believe, the most important election that we've seen. And people say that every year, but I do truly believe that if we're not successful this election cycle, the America we know and the America we've seen in the past will not be the America our kids and our grandkids know. And I think that we are the tip of the spear of returning America back to the prosperous, free, exciting, dynamic place that it has been and that I think it will continue to be. We're going to do that on the backs of the American people, not on the backs of bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. 
but this is such an important election cycle. You guys have proven it by being here tonight. You could be doing a lot of things. It means a lot to me that you're here. I appreciate it. But I encourage you guys, like I said, I don't care if you're voting for me or somebody else or who you like or who you don't like. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being involved. Thanks for being an informed voter. And make sure that when you leave here, you're not 50 people that go vote in November. You're 50 people that for the next five months you're going to be talking at every public event. You're going to be talking at the kitchen table, at work, at church, at little league games, at football games. And you're going to make sure your family, your friends, and everyone else you know goes and votes. And they vote on the issues that matter to them, not these distractions, because this election is so important. So thanks for being here. It does mean a lot. I appreciate it. Yes, we did. We did.